Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Last month I made a video that explored the Royal Court in Tudor England, which I will be leaving linked. In that video, among other things, I discussed the monarch's privy chamber, and this referred to both a physical location, namely their private apartments, but also to a group of people. Their carefully selected household companions and friends. By attending upon the monarch in their private apartments, the individuals of the privy chamber enjoyed exclusive access to their ruler. From this position, they could offer advice and ask for favours almost completely at their will. But they could also commodify their proximity to Majesty by offering to communicate on behalf of those who had been placed outside of the Privy Chamber. And they would, I presume, do this in exchange for favours, information, gifts, etc. Another key point about the Privy Chamber is that it was, to an almost complete degree, sex segregated. So Henry VIII and Edward VI Privy Chambers would be male spaces while Mary I and Elizabeth I were female. As Elizabeth would never marry, there's also not going to be a king consort in residence, someone who could have privy apartments of his own that could be filled with the ambitious young men of court who would normally expect to serve a regnant male. Indeed, throughout Elizabeth's reign, there were only two fully salaried gentlemen of the privy chamber. Because of their sex, their role and indeed their access to the monarch would simply not be able to have the same level of intimacy that would be enjoyed by their female counterparts in the privy chamber. They aren't going to be alone with their queen. They aren't going to help her dress or bathe or use the toilet. The leading men in the Elizabethan government, her chief advisers and her privy councillors, are just not free to move within the queen's private rooms. If she for some reason chooses to secrete herself in her personal apartments and for some reason decided not to come into the presence or the council chamber, it's going to be very difficult for the business of state to actually take place. One of the reasons that we know so much more about the ladies who served Elizabeth compared with those who served in the rooms of, for example, her father's consorts is due to the political power that these women were able to wield and they could do this because there was a vacuum of private royal spaces available for males to fill. The canny Elizabethan Privy Councillor is going to recognise the usefulness of fostering mutually beneficial relationships with one or more of Elizabeth's ladies. In turn, the motivated member of the Privy Chamber is going to recognise the value of her influence and she's going to choose to wield it accordingly and presumably to serve her own ends when she deals with the members of the Privy Council who want her favours. However, this power and influence that was enjoyed by members of the Privy Chamber would be conditional on them remaining in the Queen's favour. Disappoint Elizabeth and you would likely lose both your place and your influence. But what about the woman who served Elizabeth the longest? The one who it is said was with her almost from her infancy until that woman's own death nearly 30 years later. Let's talk about Catherine Champanon, someone who history remembers better as Cat Ashley or Astley. It is not uncommon for us to have difficulty in pinpointing dates of birth or known events in the early life of people from the past who were not born to members of the royal family. And this is equally true in the case of Catherine Champenon. Indeed, it's arguably even more the case, because not only do we not know when she was born, there is also a debate over who her parents were. To my mind, the most likely of the potential candidates on offer are Sir Philip Champenon and his wife Catherine. If these are her parents, then that means that Cat's sister was Joan, who becomes Joan Lady Denny after she marries Sir Anthony Denny. Sir Anthony Denny was a member of King Henry VIII's privy chamber from around the 1530s, and he even ends up with that most coveted role of groom of the stool. So, this would certainly be a very useful brother-in-law for Cat to have. 
What does seem to be apparent is that whomever Kat's immediate family were, they recognised the value of female education. As Charlotte Merton points out, quote, her distinctive, if old-fashioned, hand, her lifelong association with the Reformed religion and her key role in the education of Princess Elizabeth indicate that she received a better education than most women of her class and generation. She, Cat, was commended for her learning. Merton has Cat becoming part of Elizabeth's household by October 1536. Some give July as the actual month of her arrival, while others, including Patrick Collinson, have her joining the household in the 1540s instead. But I wonder if this later date might in fact be linked to her marrying, and thus becoming Cat Ashley or Astley in the records, rather than a recognition of her true arrival in the household, which would, of course, have happened under her maiden name. So, if we're going to take Merton's date of by October 1536 as the correct one, then this means that Cat comes into Elizabeth's life when she has just turned three years old. October 1536 is also going to be five months after Elizabeth's father had executed her mother, and she has gone from being the Princess Elizabeth to simply the Lady Elizabeth. If this is true, then Cat is going to be a, if not the, stable constant in the young Elizabeth's life from this point on. Against this backdrop of change and trauma, Elizabeth and Kat's famously close relationship is, I think, given a clear foundation and thus potentially greater context. Kat's place in Elizabeth's household is credited to Sir Thomas Cromwell, but it is likely that it was further supported by Sir Anthony Denny. And Denny marries Kat's sister, if indeed we have the right parents for Kat, on the 9th of February 1538. And this is less than two years after it's believed that she may have entered Elizabeth's household. So perhaps, if this is the case, Denny and Joan were already courting by this point. Kat's own marriage would take place in around 1545. The groom was John Astley. John's aunt on his mother's side was Elizabeth, and she married Sir James Boleyn, and thus was the aunt of Anne Boleyn. After Anne's fall, however, this side of the Boleyn family got off almost completely unscathed. Instead, these family ties are the ones that are credited with the places that John is able to obtain at court. Because before his time in Elizabeth's household, which we think probably commences after his marriage to Cat, before this, John is recorded as being a gentleman waiter in the household of Prince Edward. The birth of the future Edward VI on the 24th of October 1537, would lead to another significant change in the life of his four-year-old half-sister Elizabeth. This little girl's household had been in the charge of her governess, Lady Margaret Bryan, until Edward's birth, at which point Lady Bryan transferred to take charge of his household and upbringing. For the decade between 1537 and 1547, Lady Bryan's replacement was Lady Blanche Herbert of Troy. But during this period, most likely, Cat was also there, caring for and helping to educate her young charge. And in 1547, it was Cat who took up the position of governess to the now teenaged Elizabeth. Patrick Collinson states that, quote, Elizabeth's education began under Astley. When Astley had taught her as much as she could, she acquired as tutor William Grindle, a favourite pupil of the greatest educationist of the age, Roger Ascham, who had himself been taught by John Cheek, now tutor to Edward. Ascham himself kept a close eye on Elizabeth's lessons, for which he assumed direct responsibility after Grindle's untimely death in January 1548. Grindle, and then Ascham, may have set the academic curriculum, but it was Cat who had the responsibility of effectively raising Elizabeth. It was her who had to ensure that Elizabeth would have all the expected talents, skills, attitude and deportment that were deemed to be fitting for a daughter of King Henry VIII. After Henry's death on the 28th of January 1547, Cat would remain with Elizabeth 
when she moved to live with the Dowager Queen Catherine Parr and then subsequently with her new husband, Thomas Seymour. I do have a video on Thomas Seymour that I will leave linked. Later, Cat would say that her husband had warned her that, quote, the Lady Elizabeth did bear some affection to my Lord Admiral, for he did mark that when anybody did talk well of my Lord Admiral, she seemed to be well pleased therewith, and sometime she would blush when he was spoken of. Cat, for her part, would come to claim, when she was being questioned by the authorities, that on one occasion she, quote, bade him, that's Thomas Seymour, go away for shame and that she also chastised him, saying, quote, It was a shame to see a man come so, bare-legged, to a maiden's chamber. Perhaps she did. Or perhaps she was simply hoping to downplay her support for a man who had now become so dangerously toxic. In an article from 1984, Esther Clifford would write, quote, Even her beloved governess, Cat Ashley, had played her, meaning Elizabeth, false, in the Seymour affair. Further to this, Charlotte Merton asserts that Cat was, quote, quite smitten with Seymour herself. And close to the time when these events actually played out, Thomas Parry recounts how Thomas Seymour's sister-in-law, Anne Seymour, Duchess of Somerset, would come to assert that Cat, quote, was not worthy to have governance of a king's daughter. In May 1548, Elizabeth leaves the residence of Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour for the less scandalous home of Sir Anthony Denny and his wife Joan. As we discussed earlier, it is thought likely that Cat was Joan's sister. However, I do think it's worth just flagging up, especially considering that these women now have this close connection to Elizabeth and thus are also living in the same house because Cat does go with Elizabeth, I do think it's worth flagging up that there is no source from the time that references Cat and Joan being sisters. And I do think that's a little bit odd. However, that is just the case that there is no extant source. So perhaps there was something that made reference to this from the time that's either been lost or destroyed since. I guess we just have to make of that what we will. Either way, Elizabeth would soon be at the head of her own household, which would principally reside at Hatfield, and this would happen from December of 1548. Just prior to this December move, the Dowager Queen was expecting her first child, and she would give birth to a daughter, Mary, and then swiftly die from complications from that childbirth on the 5th of September, 1548. This tragedy left Thomas Seymour a widower, and thus left him free to marry again. For some reason, Cat threw her support behind the notion that Thomas should marry Elizabeth. And I have to say, I do wonder what precisely motivated Cat to meddle in this matter. Was it her own admiration for him? Did she truly believe he would make Elizabeth happy? Did she see it as an honourable and suitable match? Had Seymour and her made a deal... Or was it something else? I would love to know your thoughts in the comments section. As it was, Thomas Seymour would fall spectacularly at the very start of 1549. The interrogations of his known associates had begun in the January, and Thomas himself would be arrested on the 17th of February 1549. He would be found guilty and then executed for treason on the 20th of March of that year. Unfortunately for Elizabeth and Cat, his plan to marry Elizabeth was deemed to be an integral part of his treasonous plots by his accusers in the government. Cat was swiftly separated from Elizabeth and sent to the Tower of London for her interrogations. Her husband John was also removed from Elizabeth's household and likewise imprisoned. At the same time, Elizabeth found herself being rigorously questioned too. While Elizabeth gave nothing up, Cat, who was likely and understandably utterly terrified, just started spilling everything. She gave up tales of early morning visits to Elizabeth's bedchamber, where Seymour, half-dressed, would try to get into bed with her, smack her bottom and kiss her. Cat told of embraces and of the occasion when Catherine Parr joined in, 
when she held Elizabeth while Thomas cut the dress she was wearing to ribbons. To my mind, this all represents a dangerously indiscreet breach of trust, one that endangered Elizabeth's reputation and arguably even her life. Nevertheless, it was evidently one that Elizabeth was able to overlook and or forgive. And perhaps that's because the events that Kat recounted were enough. They gave the government enough to successfully pursue Thomas Seymour as a traitor, which then ultimately shifted the focus away from Elizabeth. And this fact does make me wonder whether Katz and Elizabeth had made a plan for what she should disclose if the worst were to happen, especially considering the fact that it does seem that Elizabeth's trust in Kat was wholly unchanged despite this breach of confidence. If Elizabeth had agreed to the tales to be told prior to this, then I think that goes a long way in explaining her forgiveness and indeed her continuing trust in Kat. Do you agree? Elizabeth and the Astleys would escape further censure at this time, and soon Elizabeth would be petitioning for them to be allowed to return to her household and service. This request would be granted, and both Astleys were reinstated by 1551. Cat would remain at her mistress's side during the succession crisis, as the crown passed confusingly from Edward VI to Jane Grey to Mary I. And Cat would continue to serve Elizabeth until 1556. Sir Henry Dudley was the first cousin once removed of Jane Grey, and his plot to dethrone Mary I in favour of Elizabeth would be uncovered in 1556. Cat was suspected of having been involved in this plot, which resulted in her being returned to the Tower of London as a prisoner, being dismissed from Elizabeth's service, and being banned from seeing her again. On the 17th of November 1558, Mary I died, and Elizabeth ascended to her half-sister's throne. Among her first acts was to give John Astley a particularly coveted position because she would make him one of the two fully salaried gentlemen of the Privy Chamber, the role that we discussed towards the start of the video. She also made him master of the jewel house and treasurer of the Queen's jewels and plate. In addition to these being positions of favour and trust, they were also roles that could result in financial reward coming to the person who held them. Cat, for her part, was made the chief gentleman of Elizabeth's Privy Chamber. An Italian newsletter dated to the 26th of September 1562 recounts how, quote, of late there have been committed to the court, and the translator believes this to be an evident error for the Tower, of London, some, as well men as women, that were formerly high in favour with the Queen, among them being Mrs Ashley, who had such influence with the Queen that she seemed, as it were, patroness of all England, and Mrs Durrell, who was so intimate with Her Majesty that oftentimes she slept in the same bed with her. The cause of their committal is unknown. So we have Cat back in the Tower in 1562 for reasons unknown, although Charlotte Merton suggests that she had earned herself the enmity of other leading figures within the Elizabethan regime, and that, quote, her active promotion of rivals for Elizabeth's hand in marriage angered Sir Robert Dudley and led to two more brief periods of imprisonment, the last in 1562, for encouraging the suit of Eric of Sweden, although once again she fully recovered her position at court within a matter of months. This, presumably, is only to be expected, because the other thing that the Italian newsletter tells us is that Cat, quote, had such influence with the Queen that she seemed, as it were, patroness of all England. Cat would get to be with Elizabeth for around three more years after this Italian newsletter was written. She would die on the 18th of July, 1565, from a now unknown cause. She had been with Elizabeth throughout the most dangerous years of her life, the years before she became a queen. And then she would spend nearly seven years at her side as she secured her power and authority as Queen of England. A loss of this magnitude was surely a profound one for the now 31-year-old Elizabeth. But what do you think? 
What factor or factors bound Elizabeth to Cat so strongly? What motivated Cat to stay so resolutely at Elizabeth's side? Was Elizabeth right to trust Cat? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video, or you can come and find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, so do consider following me over on some or indeed all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then do let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to the channel and if you think you are subscribed and you don't want to be unsubscribed against your will, please just have a little check. YouTube is up to its old tricks. Make sure you're still subscribed if you want to be. And now is the perfect time. I'm just going through the usual things I do at the end of the video. So while you are checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, then you can also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button. And at that point, a menu is gonna appear. So you can also hit all in that and allegedly that means that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.